pleasure to introduce uh, Nick Clofford. He is going to be presenting um, uh, ongoing research, very interesting one, in the general misfortune of mankind, the anti-federalist, police centricity, and the perpetuation of political uh, institutions. I will keep the queue, so you have uh, around half an hour. Uh, for those that are online, uh, please raise your hand or let us know in the chat. Um, okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'd like by, to start by flagging uh, the fact that I'm trying uh, really to bring in more of Vincent Ostrom's ideas, particularly more of the political theory focus with this presentation. Vincent Ostrom studied the Federalist at length and, and made some major contributions. But at the same time, I want to include Lynn Ostrom's approach and start with a problem, a puzzle. And it's the most difficult problem in all of politics. How do you perpetuate political institutions? Uh, foundings turn out to be the easier part. It's keeping the thing going after the orders have merged. So, and the greatest of play by the greatest of political philosopher, King Lear starts with this problem. He's founded this kingdom, it's vast, it's great, but he has to perpetuate it beyond his life because in monarchy, you have to deal with the mortality of the king. A few hundred years later, in the Republican context, Abraham Lincoln's faced with the exact same problem. How do you perpetuate political institutions? He starts with this at the start of career uh, in 1837, and it remains a problem throughout his whole presidency. So I wanna talk a little bit about the Federalists, uh, but I think they've gotten a lot of discussion, so I wanna limit this, this as much as possible but the Federalists make major contributions to the study of federalism and also polycentricity, as Vincent Ostrom pointed out. Uh, they believe that you can use ambition and interests to counteract against each other and prevent factions from forming and taking over. They believed in the separation of powers and the need for a strong national government that can unite peoples and unite in different states. They believe in a variety of republicanism that's slightly different from the anti-federalist republicanism which we'll talk about more. And they believed in constitutionalism. That is that a constitution is a higher law than the or normal norms and rules and practice. And they believed that in some way you could make energy and liberty go together, which was a radical innovation. And ultimately they believed all this stuff falls under a community of interest and that the passions of the people were less essential for this project. So who were the anti-federalists, the subject of this talk? They were the opponents uh, of the ratification of the Constitution. They were not against federalism. Many of them believed they were the true federalists. And in some ways, they come closer to the, our understandings of federalism. Uh, in fact, Eldridge Jerry says at various points, we, we ought to have been called the rats and anti-rats, not the federalists and anti-federalists. But the, the federalists here won the brandy quite uh, starkly. So they represent a diverse group of people, important figures of the time, uh, future presidents, John Quincy Adams, James Monroe, radicals of the revolution, Patrick Henry, George Mason, uh, important New York figures uh, like Melanchthon Smith, and of course, uh, someone I really wanna highlight, Mercedes Warren, who turns out to be one of the most thoughtful uh, thinkers of the American Revolution, and it has been significantly understudied. Uh, partially because she was not able to be involved in politics for obvious reasons, I think she turns out to be the most thoughtful uh, of the anti-federalists and maybe one of the most thoughtful of the founders just on the nature of politics. So I wanna make sure to highlight that the anti-federalists and federalists, those who opposed and supported the constitution still broadly agreed on the ends of politics and the ends of their entire debate. Uh, they, they both believed in reflection and choice. They thought you could do a government uh, by people and you didn't need an overarching king or sovereign to come and uh, make these determinations for you. You didn't need accident and force. Uh, and I really wanna highlight this point because this has been a major point of contention amongst anti-federal scholars. There's been an attempt to paint the anti-federalist as civic Republicans, as some sort of primordial, hanging on to ancient political theory against the modernist uh, federalists. I don't think this is correct. And uh, one of the great 
uh, scholars of the anti-federalist Herbert Storing also came to this conclusion at various points, but unfortunately, um, I think died before he had the chance to elaborate on it further. So broadly, they believed in liberalism, the anti-federalists as well as the federalists. Uh, they believed that the goal of politics was to protect rights and secure these rights. Uh, they believed that the common good was important, but the common good wasn't the goal of politics. I think they also thought, and I agree, that if you secure liberty and you secure rights, uh, ultimately you get something like the common good as a result. Uh, they all believed in the Declaration of Independence. In fact, I don't think it's until later that uh, thinkers in America like Calhoun, uh, Douglas Stevens, uh, or Alexander Stevens, uh, and that unfortunate senator from Indiana start to th say things like the Declaration of Independence is a self-evident lie. Both the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists supported the, the ideas, and I think that's why it's such a powerful document and is able to unite the country. They also both believed in compound republicanism uh, and even used that term very early, uh, which, which is fascinating. They believe you could divide competencies and you could divide sovereignty. Now, the Anti-Federalists were a lot more skeptical about how you could do this, but they still both agreed that this compound republic was possible and a great way to secure liberty. This is against Douglas, who calls it a contradiction in terms, or uh, Calhoun, who causes this a contradiction in terms uh, uh, several years later. Uh, and ultimately, they all rely on the same sources of argument. They rely on Montesquieu, the Bible the most, uh, but Montesquieu and Locke and Blackstone. And in fact, it's, it's fascinating to read because the Federalists and Anti-Federalists are quoting back and forth uh, just different quotes from these uh, authors with different interpretations. And this proves to be, I mean, they treat them as pretty dispositive. So I think more study could be done on where the anti-federalists got some of these thinkers right or where the federalists got them right uh, to, to understand uh, the nature of the argument. So just a word about the major papers of the anti-federalists, because although there are federalist papers beyond the main 85 essays by Publius, those essays provide a very coherent vision of uh, what Federalist thought generally was. And those essays by, by Hamilton, Madison, and Jay uh, have been one of the main sources in constitutional interpretation uh, over our history. This is, I think, contributes to the understudy of the anti-Federalists is that they're an eclectic group. They range in political ideologies, they range in arguments, and they aren't a coherent series of, of papers. Uh, a lot of times they're based out of one state writing on issues related to those that state. So you've got the, the really important paper, the Brutus, Cato, Sentinel, and Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, then we have these major anti-federals who give speeches, George Mason, Patrick Henry, Robert Yates, Luther Martin, Mercy Otis Warren uh, in her letters, and uh, George Clinton. Um, so at the same time, we don't know the identity of a lot of these authors. Uh, there's been lots of speculation, but then every couple of years, there's counter speculation. It, it, the interesting thing is the one we know dispositively is that the Colombian patriot was Mercy Otis Warren. Uh, which is fascinating because for a long time, people weren't sure, but we know from letters, pretty certain. But broadly, we don't know the authorship of a lot of these papers. I think a lot of this is because the anti-federalists lose the debate. And once you've, on, on a lot of issues, and it was very politically unpopular to be an anti-federalist afterwards. So some of these men might have been protecting their political careers and, and not revealed their authorship. I, I want to flag the federal farmer because he turns out to be the most in depth in the longest series of essays that really respond well to these arguments. And I've heard some studies that the circulation of the federal farmers letters is bigger even than Publius's 85 Federalist Papers. Uh, I, I've heard conflicting points on that, but, but that's worth, worth noting. So to touch on some of the major ideas of the anti-Federalists, and then I'm going to try to tie these in with polycentricity in the Bloomington School, because we are here. Uh, they believed that small republics were the best. Uh, they draw heavily on Montesquieu on this point. But as uh, Vincent Ostrom points out, Montesquieu is very aware of the trade-offs of having small republics. Uh, on the one hand, a small republic's more coherent, less, uh, there's gonna be less internal division and strife, but the other side of it, it's vulnerable to outside attack. 
So um, Hamilton's answer to this and the Federalists is you do a sort of federalism where you can get the benefits from large republics and uh, uh, also the benefits of small republics. Anti-federalists are less uh, optimistic that you can do this. They still want a variety of federalism, but they think that uh, the, a federal government has to be very, very limited and can't be a national government. They're also concerned about opulence. They routinely uh, refer to European luxury as an insult. Uh, their idea was this national government's going to be filled with people in a distant place. They're going to be jetting off to Europe uh, to go to these uh, important meetings with, uh, with the other diplomats. And uh, this is used as an attack uh, due to the scale. The other problem with the scale, of course, is the execution of laws. They don't think you'll be able to do execution of laws over a vast country, even though at that point, the country is significantly smaller than it is today. And this relates to the governability and knowledge problem. Uh, the knowledge problem that Hayek uh, would later show us uh, the anti-federalists start predicting. They think local communities are going to have the most information about how to govern themselves. And this turns out to be a scale problem. Uh, and we've got a good quote from Sentinel, but through the time I'll, I'll move forward. They're very concerned about ambiguity and complexity. And uh, this is something we think about in the Bloomington School that, that I'm going to touch on later. Uh, but on the issue of sovereignty, they think you can divide sovereignty. But if it's unclear about who is sovereign uh, over what competency, their concern is it's going to shift. The sovereignty is going to shift to the national government away from states. Uh, and this is I mean, broadly what happened. Uh, but they're concerned also with courts. Uh, Brutus, in particular, uh, has a scathing review of the court. And it isn't that the judiciary power will, uh, will seize everything. It's that the judiciary will interpret ambiguous phrases in favor of more government. Um, and that uh, part of this problem, too, is the legislative, executive, judiciary powers are too undefined for the anti-federalist. And the word, this lack of definition, will lead to the encroachment, say, the executive branch carrying out legislative functions, just because it's not, it's not clear. Uh, and they're skeptical of the new political science that, that Publius is proposing. Uh, and this is not to say they're ancients. I, I think that interpretation is wrong. But they do recognize a certain benefit to the old regimes uh, that uh, maybe Herbert Storing calls them conservatives in this regard, that maybe we shouldn't throw out everything and, and try this new thing uh, that hasn't been tested. Uh, and uh, this great quote from Patrick Henry, a constitution not to be like a beacon held up to the public eye so as to be understood by every man. And, uh, you know, uh, coming from a legal background, uh, lawyers don't agree what the constitution means. Uh, and so, their concern is how are the people going to uh, have any idea what it means. So they're really concerned, and I think this idea resonates uh, today, with elite governance. They call it the aristocratic tendency. They, they thought because of the small number of officers uh, in the United States Senate, in the United States House of Representatives, that these are only going to be really rich people. And it turns out to be correct. And these are going to be the people uh, of, of who are high born you know, of, of, of political families. Uh, and ultimately, this is going to uh, isolate them and sort of give them a, a greenhouse effect that they're, uh, they're going to be uh, too far from the ordinary people to understand how, how their lives actually work. And that this distant federal city will become a swamp of corruption and, and uh, uh, aristocratic government. And ultimately, uh, they push the critique further, particularly the federal farmer. They say, even if you get the best people in these positions of power, the actual, the natural aristoi, the smartest people, all this stuff, it's not going to matter because the local people won't trust them. Uh, so ultimately, there's this problem of actually electing the best people, but the anti-federals take it a step further and say, even if you do that, you're still in, in trouble. One thing the anti-federals touch on uh, that uh, the uh, federals broadly don't see as much of a problem within the system they're designing is, is, is civic virtue and the importance of, of promoting it. Uh, I don't want to say this is entirely true. I mean, we have uh, 
Washington saying in his uh, inaugural that there's an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness. And certainly all the founders thought virtue was important. But the anti-federalists take a special look at it, and, and they see it and kind of predict Tocqueville's challenge that Vince Nostrom addressed, that you need more than just interest to balance a government. You need a citizenship, ideas about citizenship that relates to republicanism. Uh, and you need a civic virtue uh, and a community that's a moral community, not just a community of interest. Part of this also is, is juries. Uh, and uh, if, if there's one single policy complaint the anti-federals point to the most, it's the lack of the juries in the unamended uh, Constitution. Uh, and uh, they, they predict Tocqueville's argument that the juries would serve as a national education. They see juries as not just this thing that secures liberty, but also this thing that educates citizens about the law, uh, which, which is important. Um, and I've included this quote for Aurelian about moderation that, that I found that I, I think is, is fascinating. And it, it shows, I think, that the anti-federal, some of them are radicals, like radical Democrats, but others are saying, oh, no, let's listen to Montesquieu about moderation. And, and that, that ought to be, ought to be uh, how, we, how we deal with and I don't want to spend too much time on this because, of course, the anti-federal's major contribution is that we got a bill of rights. Uh, this wasn't uh, uh, initially expected and it was argued against vehemently by some of the federalists. Uh, but ultimately, we get a bill of rights. At the same time, bill of rights is written predominantly by federalists with anti-federalist ideas. But in, in, the, in the first Congress, the, the anti-federalists are completely wiped out. Uh, and uh, so ultimately, it's, it's Madison. Uh, Federalist uh, who, who, who drafts uh, the Bill of Rights. And he does something really interesting in this. He uh, is able to isolate the most extreme of the anti-Federalists with his proposed Bill of Rights and get some of the, the more moderate anti-Federalists on his side, uh, which turns out to be a, a, a brilliant political maneuver. So a, a word on contemporary relevance. I, I think the anti-federals are, are having a little bit of a moment uh, that they were very little talked about uh, for, for the bulk of the 20th century, uh, except by some progressive historians who attempted to paint them as, uh, you know, the, uh, the low middle class uh, versus the rich elite federalists. Uh, but broadly, I don't think that critique quite works because, uh, well, many of the anti-federalists were from the middle class. Also, a lot of their leaders are, are the richest uh, in society. Uh, so uh, after Herbert Storing's publishing of the complete anti-federalists, we see in the 90s a sort of boom in some anti-federal scholarship. And in the legal world, we've really seen this skyrocket. I, I, I saw one study that it's like single digit per decade citations at the Supreme Court of the anti-federalists for the bulk of the 20th century. And now it's 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 exploding. And especially at the lower courts, uh, in the Federal Court of Appeals, the anti-federalists are now cited routinely by a number of very prominent judges uh, who, have, who have told lawyers, if you wanna make good arguments in our court, go back and read both sides of the deba debate. So I think this is also relevant because a lot of the anti-federalist concerns are uh, ones that stick with us, uh, concerns about elites. Uh, not trusting institutions. These are things we see routinely in our, our present political debates that I think the anti-federalists can show us uh, these are enduring problems. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of problems in politics are, are enduring. Uh, example, Lincoln versus Douglas is the same as Thrasymachus versus Socrates. It's, it's the same debate and same with the anti-federalists in today. And I think that's because broadly these debates are in the nature of politics and not just set in one time period. Um, so to get to the Bloomington School and polycentricity, I, 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 I'm hoping to do this more in the paper, uh, but, but I've, I've laid out some anti-federalist arguments and if you haven't I, it, spotted them, I think a lot of them overlap closer with polycentricity in the Bloomington School than the federalist arguments. Um, part of this issue, and it's important for polycentricity is subsidiarity. Uh, they believe that if you can do local governance at the lowest possible level, that's where you should do it. Now, that isn't 100% in, in our study of polycentricity, but polycentricity, uh, polycentric governance identifies the importance of localism in ways that I think other um, areas ignore. Uh, their federalism, I think, is actually 
uh, and Vincent Ostrom puts uh, uh, Hobbes on the one end, the unitary, and uh, the Federalist and Publius on the other end as the, the polycentric, I, I'd like to reframe that a little bit. I, I think it's actually Hobbes, Publius in the middle, and then the most polycentric uh, is, is the anti-Federalists. Uh, further, if, if you look at all their papers, the, this emphasis on you need shared local norms and values. Uh, you need rules and use and uh, uh, the, the formal rules. Uh, and, and this is something that the uh, anti-Federalists absolutely cover much uh, more in depth than the Federalists who are more concerned with uh, a, a formal structure of rules within the 85 anti-Federalist or Federalist papers. Uh, facility communications, huge. Uh, they thought you local people would not be able to address their concerns to a distant uh, le distant leaders in the national government. And that's why they really valued local governments and state legislatures, because back in then you knew your state legislature uh, and you could uh, talk to them and, and, and share it and communicate better. Uh, just huge, there's huge, and, and we see this borne out by history, there's huge entry and exit costs with lobbying of the national government uh, in, in distant DC. I like that they call it the, the federal city, a very negative terms throughout their papers, but, uh, and then broadly, the centralization problem, which uh, uh, Vincent Ostrom talks in his section on the eclipse of federalism. And, and he identifies the Garcia case, uh, this case about uh, wages uh, for a uh, uh, for a local authority. And, and some people have pointed that this is the real, the, the, expand, the most expansion of the commerce power, which some of the anti-federalists like Agrippa are concerned about. Uh, and that this is really withering away at uh, this idea of federalism in the compound republic. Um, he, he writes this in 1991, and he's not sure where, where, where it's going to go. Uh, Vincent Ostrom isn't. But then we get Lopez, a case that sort of starts to rein in the commerce power. Uh, but then that's 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 really all we get. So um, it, it's interesting to see the very clear overlap with some of Vincent Ostrom's critiques and uh, the anti-federalists. So I want to talk about sustainability because that's essential for the Bloomington School and for this problem that we started with, how you perpetuate political institutions. Uh, the federals think you can found this order and then over time uh, it will be revered more. And they talk about this in Federals 49 and that, that you don't need stewards quite like the, the anti-federals identify. Uh, the anti-federals take the opposite position. Uh, they say that you need, uh, immediately after the revolution, you have this spirit of liberty. You've got the people watchful uh, on the expansions of government, but as time, this fades. So they think you need to forever refresh this. And I think uh, this is something that, that that's being uncovered uh, uh, as we study polycentricity and the need for stewards is that you, you get a good emergent orders but you need a, a people and you need uh, interested parties uh, to keep refreshing it and, and keep it going and correcting the errors, especially as, as time changes. So I, I, I included these two quotes because I think they're just fascinating for the nature of politics. And it, it shows the brilliance of Mercy Otis Warren, who, who, like I said, I think deserves significantly uh, more study. Uh, but she's less optimistic, I think, than the Bloomington School. So th this is a difference. She recognizes the same similar problems, but uh, you, you can see less optimism. Uh, we, we've got this, this famous refrain we like here at the workshop of how fallible human beings can nonetheless achieve and sustain self-governance in the face of a complex and ever-changing social and physical world. But that's very optimistic that we, we can do it. Warren is identifying the challenge, but I think is uh, is more concerned that, at least under the system, the Constitution, she's writing this in, in her in her history in 1805, that this is going to be very difficult to do. Um, and uh, while I'm still, I'm not making the case that uh, Mercy Otis Warren belongs to Virginia School of Political Economy, uh, I'm uh, just flagging that as, as a overlap, but a, a major difference. And so I, I, I really think these two problems are interesting because uh, there are problems where the anti-federals say, say this is an insurmountable problem, but polycentricity has shown us benefits or why these are problems we can overcome them. 
they don't think you can do republics over a uh, vast heterogeneous population uh, and that you need, you know, government might be good for a southerner, but not for somebody in, in Maryland. And, uh, and this was an idea that Montesquieu who talked about a lot. But, but polycentricity has really shown us that it, it can be used as a tool to help solve problems that multi-ethnic and heterogeneous populations face. Uh, so I, I think this deserves more study. Um, and and, and, and it's, it's been very well explored, but I'd like to tie it in more as a solution to uh, anti-federalist complaints. The other big one is, is they're very concerned about complexity and ambiguity, the anti-federalists. And uh, people from the Bloomington School have shown us that complexity and ambiguity can be a huge problem, but they also have lots of benefits. Uh, and I think this is part of understanding the compound republic. It, it is ambiguous who has the power in certain instances, but that leads to shared sharing of that power. Uh, that, that's that's a major element of, of when we think about polycentric governance. Uh, and in complexity has gives us lots of chances and opportunities for experimentation. But at the same time, I think we are recognizing more and more that, that some government institutions, even if they're designed very well, uh, if they're too complex for people to understand, it's still a problem. But this, this I think, shows that there's positive and negatives to, to these things, but uh, still fascinating. So uh, I want to conclude just generally uh, with a... Uh, wild speculation, but first with uh, a more solid uh, uh, statement of where I think we should go. I think that uh, anti-federal political theory is actually a lot closer to the Bloomington School and how we study polycentric governance than, than federalist uh, uh, theory is. That being said, we ha we live in a uh, world where the we have a constitution that the federalists got ratified, uh, and they still offer some good alternatives. And really, I think the decline in American federalism or the eclipse in American federalism had, had broadly uh, been uh, not entirely the fault of, of the Constitution because it, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. So I still think going back and reading the Federalists, they were right about a lot, uh, but understanding the debate that there was another side and, and they made some very good points. Uh, and ultimately, I think that the anti-federals have been understudied everywhere, but if they're going to be studied more, I think the Bloomington School and the Ocean Workshops a good place to do it because uh, they really just have such wonderful overlaps uh, that, uh, that I think it's a shame that uh, they've been ignored. And so this is a little more out there of a point, but it's, it's where I want to go. Uh, and uh, I think ending with Lincoln is always good. But uh, Herbert Storing, uh, well, well, shortly before he died, wrote about and, and talked about some, this idea as a simplification that Lincoln author, offers us some synthesis uh, between Federalist and anti-Federalist thought. He's able to combine the start of his career, cold calculating reason with this need for stewards. Uh, the second inaugural, as I read it, is uh, a, a sermon to the people of America that you have to be good stewards and work together to keep this keep this thing going. Uh, so I, I think he offers a wonderful synthesis and I, I, I'd like to explore that more, uh, but I, I, I'd like to bring Lincoln into the study of polycentricity as we deal with this problem of stewardship and how we perpetuate uh, orders after they've emerged. So that's, uh, that's where I'm at. Why you fine? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so who wants to jump first? People online too. So students have the priority as always. So if someone wants to start, comments, questions. I'll break the ice. Okay. Okay. You know I mean? you go. Okay. Nick, excellent presentation. You did a clear survey of the main themes there. And I want to congratulate you on that. The link with the Bloomington School is excellent as well. I do have one comment. I'm going to read a passage from uh, from um, Oring, and I'd like to, to comment. I don't I don't have any suggestions for improving. So this is what um, Storing says: um, the anti-federalists could neither fully reject nor fully accept the leading principles of the Constitution. They were indeed open to Hamilton's conflict charge of trying to reconcile contradictions. They had reasons and the reasons have weight. The anti-federalists were committed to both union and the states, 
to both the great American Republic and the small self-governing community, to both commerce and civic virtue, to both private gain and public good. So my question, if there is one, would be, isn't this the solution for us today? And in a way, uh, how far are we from, from this synthesis, which is an eclectic synthesis? And I want to bring the concept of eclecticism on your radar screen to describe the similarity between the anti federalist and the Bloomington School. Well, your your essay on on that topic is, I think, one of the first things I cite in the paper in the introduction. So, <laughs> I yeah, I, I'm I think that's right. I but I think that's the case for studying the anti federalists more. Uh, and and it doesn't need to be. It's interesting. Uh, a sitting Supreme Court justice was asked uh, uh, about a year or two ago. Uh, whether he had, he would have been an anti-federalist or a federalist, and he said an anti-federalist. And I, I don't think the debate should be about whether the anti-federalists were right, because ultimately I don't think their project would have worked if we'd been a series of small republics, Spain or France would have invaded us. But I think the project should be about pulling in ideas. And I, I think that's what a lot of the workshop's about. It's uh, different disciplines. Uh, pulling in different ideas. So I, so I, so I, hopefully in the paper, I'll be able to contribute some to that synthesis. Mike, do you want to go? Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and Nick, thanks for this presentation. Sorry, I can't be there in person. Long story. Um, I'm curious about this um, idea of Lincoln as a synthesis between these two sides. And uh, I got to say, I can't quite see it. And and could you give us a little more sense of of how Lincoln would be the one who uh, could sort of tie these longstanding disputes together uh, into a more consistent sort of framework? So I'd just like to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and thinking about it, I, I have a, an immediate visceral reaction because one, one of the ways Lincoln's been painted as has been as a person who federalizes and actually you know expands the power of the federal government uh and uh, ultimately I, I think he has to for uh, the Civil War uh but uh, but I'm I more mean and I more see the idea as a, a synthesis within uh, Lincoln's political theory uh Lincoln heavily emphasizes the Declaration uh, of Independence and the fact that the Declaration of Independence was correct, uh, which which hadn't been called into question, but was called into question uh, um, during during in the lead up to the Civil War. So ultimately, I think it has something to do with him understanding that you need reverence for the laws, you need cold calculating reason, you need to be able to design a constitution that works formally, and you have to implement the constitution formally. But you need a moral community. It can't just be based on interests. You need uh, everybody has to have a moral share, an agreement on certain first principles. Uh, and so the, the big challenge is how do you unite, unite a country uh, uh, so vast on a small number of principles? I think the Declaration of Independence gives us some pretty good ones. Uh, uh, equality and, and liberty are, are pretty good principles. But I, but ultimately the. The thing that unites the country uh, for Lincoln has to be something that's true. It can't just be a, a positivist construction. Um, so, yeah, I, I, and in storing even says that the, it's a simplification, but not a misleading simplification. So, uh, I mean, can, can I push back a little bit on on that and have sort of a follow up yes. question? Yeah, um, Mike, please, yes. Uh, thanks, um, Lincoln. Um, sort of following his slow movement from um, uh, uh, from someone who was, well, it's kind of hard to summarize Lincoln's attitude on slavery, for example, very, very clearly, but but he certainly was not a rabid uh, uh, abolitionist at the at the beginning, and he really wasn't at the end either uh, of his life. it's 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 hard to tell <clears throat> what would have happened if he'd stayed alive and um, for a second term, which is I think a great disaster for the country. But um, at the end, as I understand Lincoln's view of it, there still was, he did not hold out much hope for there really being an integrated community where you would have whites and blacks um, working together uh, in a community. He still seemed to have a preference for finding a way for 
sending most of the African-Americans back to Africa or, or giving them some sort of other sort of place where they could have their own little community and they could live. But, but he didn't have this sense of a multi-ethnic community that I think comes out of the, the, the federal sort of tradition, um, I think. I mean, I don't, I mean, it comes out of the Declaration of Independence to some extent, but, um, and, and I can see that Lincoln's insistence on having a common morality, he kind of seemed skeptical that, that his fellow um, uh, whites would be able to accept uh, equality with with blacks and be better if they just sort of split. So how does that sort of great ambiguity at the heart of the great emancipator sort of um, fit into what you see him as synthesizing between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists? Well, I, I'm not sure there's as much ambiguity. I think he's a very careful politician. Uh, but I mean, shortly before he shot, and some people have said might have played as a contributing factor to him being shot, uh, he's talking about political equality uh, in, in really radical terms. Uh, I, I think he is able to chart uh, in this whole debate people like Garrison, who are against the Declaration because he's in against the Constitution entirely, uh, because no union uh, with, with slaveholders and with the people who say the union needs to break up because the South should own slaves. So he's, he, he is, uh, as always, the, I think, the, the base of moderation, uh, which which when, when we're synthesizing ideas, I think we, we get to a lot. Um, but uh, broadly, I, I do want to touch on one other point, because I think this deserves a paper. There's been a lot of debate about anti-federalists and federalists on the slavery question, because it seems like they're evenly divided. It seems like it more meant like what state you were from, Virginians and some people being uh, more pro-slavery in the North. Um, the anti-federals say some really radical things against slavery uh, that uh, would not have been welcome, uh, would not have gotten them elected if they were revealed uh, afterward. And I, I think ultimately the best of the anti-federalist writers are, are some of the most anti-slavery voices, Mellington Smith, uh, Mercy Otis Warren was involved with uh, uh, anti-slavery societies. So broadly, I don't think it, it fits differently because it, it, at the time it was uh, it was pre the Industrial Revolution and and the abolishing uh, of the of the banks. So it's just it's difficult to say. I will go and then keep <laughs> keep it. So, um, so it seems that at least historically, so national security is one important reason for you know a stronger uh, federal government, no. So any proposal within the anti-federalist on how do you manage uh, national security issues, but in a uh, institutional structure in which you have a much weaker federal government. Mm -hmm. So are they internalizing this problem and figuring out, well, we need to figure out contributions by the states. We will need to, I don't know, form a particular kind of leadership that is stronger during times of war? Do they deal with, with, with these issues? Yeah, so they do. I think it's where the, as a normative proposal, the anti-federalists are particularly weak. A lot of the anti-federalists oppose having any standing army. Uh, and ultimately, it's why they, I think, a major contributor to why they, they lose and, and the constitution gets ratified. Uh, there's apocryphal stories of, of farmers being like, uh, yes, I agree with everything Brutus and the federal farmer says, but a few summers ago, I had a bayonet pointed at my stomach and I really didn't like that. So I'm going to go with security over, over these other principles. But yeah, on the standing army, uh, there, there, there's, there's a lot of debate and discussion over that. They think that inevitably, if you have a standing army, that's going to centralize. I mean, and this was true for the bulk of history. For the bulk of history, if you had a long-term existing army, it then became the government and would, would take over. So, um, yeah, I think the anti-federalists are very weak on that. And so I don't know how to quite balance, balance that problem. I mean, today, we don't really think of that as a problem, the standing army taking over the government, but I have a real possibility for that. I have another question, but then let me pick up some questions from the... Yes, please go. Um, so I was wondering, do you think that this, uh, you know, focusing again on the anti-federalists uh, will be helpful for 
understanding the sort of history and tradition interpretation of the Constitution that's been adopted by the uh, recent Supreme Court? Yes, Judge Nelson, Ryan Nelson of the Ninth Circuit has told us to do exactly that. Uh, Judge uh, Andy Oldham has to and Judge Thapar. That, 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 I mean, the, at least the Court of Appeals judges are telling us to do that. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I, I've heard a few Supreme Court justices say, yeah, to understand the nature of the argument, uh, it's important. Now, the history and tradition test is tougher because it depends what point you're talking, whether you're talking about after the Civil War amendments or or right at the founding. But, but yeah. So, Nick, thanks. Thanks for the, the presentation. It was really clear and very nicely delivered. Thank you for that. Um, you got me thinking about something that I haven't thought about. It was based on a reading this morning. I, I was reading about uh, a court case that the Supreme Court's taking up related to air pollution from the Midwest um, going across the country. And I, I really haven't ever thought about this before. At the time when this anti-federalist debates were going on, um, outside of the defense thing, I'm wondering, what were there any conversations about negative externalities across states in the environmental arena at that period of time? Or was it, were there any talk about those kinds of issues? I haven't seen any in the environmental. Uh, there is discussion of commerce. Um, mm -hmm. the, the Commerce Clause actually doesn't get discussed as much as you think. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think they see it as the real threat to centralization and the growth of a, a federal government. They see that more as being the necessary and proper clause and supremacy clause. Uh, but Agrippa is interesting, one of the authors, and he talks about the Commerce Clause. Uh, but, but broadly, I, I don't know. I, I think the thing we can pull from the anti-federals is this issue of sustainability. Uh, for, so not explicitly environmental sustainability, but this idea that you need to sustain institutions. And I think we can draw lessons from that that we can draw the environmental uh, field. But I, I, I'll, I'll take a look. But I, uh, yeah, I couldn't think of any environmental things that might that I can remember. One suggestion that could be in the tariffs, no? They were what? in favor of like just one common tariff for the whole union, or they would have, they were considering that each state could have uh, could regulate foreign trade in different ways. That's that's probably very important. Mm -hmm. Taking into account that tariff also became one of the main revenue for the for the federal mm -hmm. government. Initially. And, and this is especially true for New York. So New York proves to be one of the most important battlegrounds for the the entire ratification debates. Not just because it has some of the best uh, anti-federalist arguments, but there were there were more anti-federalists. The governor there, uh, George Clinton, was was an anti-federalist, uh, and a lot of the debates are about uh, tariffs and and how revenue is going to work because I mean, the New York was just so an economic powerhouse uh, at this point, and they, they were aware of, of, of what it could become too. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look. Yes, please. So I was puzzling about a couple things, and. I was in Vincent's class many years ago. So your knowledge of literature is more deep and wide than mine. Um, but I'm just kind of curious about, is there an anti-federalist argument that can be made when you have negative externalities like pollution, giving other people asthma or causing cancer or whatever, or when you have, uh, to pick up on Mike's point, I'm just thinking about the when there is direct harm in a discriminatory fashion against a people. Let's let's just throw out LGBTQ people right now, or women seeking uh, to terminate pregnancies. Uh, when there are blatantly discriminatory decisions being made by local in this anti-federalist system, can there be an argument made when it is appropriate uh, for a national government to enforce some standards? Yeah, and I, I think Lincoln proves to us that it is. And uh, uh, I mean, broadly, uh, a darker side of the anti-federalists. I, I have never read so much anti-Catholic hate in one uh, one series of essays. Uh, they're, they're, a lot of them, a small group of them, oppose the Constitution because they don't like a religious test 
the fact that the Constitution bans religious tests. They said, well, what if we get someone who isn't Protestant in charge of us? What then? But I mean, this is a diverse group. Uh, and, and so uh, broadly, it's difficult to say. I think, and I'm not making the case, again, that the anti-federalists were right about everything. Uh, I think something something closer to Lincoln gets us there and can fulfill this this promise of equality uh, with the Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, I, I see that as the purpose. I, I my interpretation of the Fourteenth Amendment is much broader non discrimination doctrine. I think than the courts enforced, uh, even if it doesn't incorporate or, or do other things. <clears throat> Pick up Mike again. Uh yeah, <laughs> just a, a follow up to some of this. I I I think uh, a better area for looking at examples of externalities crossing across uh, state boundaries than uh, environmental concerns at the time would be the um, uh, the reaction or the relationships with the Native American tribes at the time, uh, who in many cases, um, certainly at the time of the uh, Constitution making were really a bigger threat than than many of the European powers at the time. And um, there was, you know, especially later in the War of 1812, uh, uh, there was sort of a more equal sort of sort of fight between the Ameri the um, whites and the uh, uh, Native Americans on that. Uh, the problem would be that that it was the Western states, uh, the new emerging in the territories, including the Northwest Territories where, where we're sitting in, um, that were most concerned about um, uh, not recognizing any sort of Indian rights or not um, uh, living up to the treaties. Whereas in the in the East, that wasn't such a big deal because most of the Native Americans had already been pushed out of that area, and it wasn't a pressing problem. And so, the I think from an anti-federalist perspective, it would be difficult to argue for why the national government should. <clears throat> engage in the kind of um, anti-indigenous uh, policy that it had on a regular basis. Now, you might argue that might have been a better policy to pursue along the way, but it wouldn't have really been a popular policy at the time. Uh, so how would the anti-federalists sort of deal with this problem that was a was seen as a national security problem by some of the states but was not really a big problem from the other states that were more concerned with economics or other kinds of kinds of things. So how do the anti-federalists deal with those kinds of externalities across states? I think that's really a good question. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. And, and I'll take more of a look. Um, there's just two things to, to point out. Uh, you know, it's difficult to say because the anti-federalists are such a different group of opinions. Uh, some of them want more democracy. Like I said, some of them are very, very anti-slavery, but not others in the South are, are supportive of it. Of it. Uh, there is one series of letters, I think it's Montezuma, but I, I'd have to go check, that is, is praising the Native American tribes and saying, they get it right. They understand how to do a political community because they're local and close to each other and, and living in, in tribes. Um, but uh, I'd have to go back and, and find that letter, and, and there might be some less seriousness uh, there. Uh, but broadly, uh, this issue of, of what might be an issue for one state, but not all of them, and the need for union, I, I think also contributes to the, the federals passing and ratifying the Constitution. Uh, Rhode Island is the biggest bulwark against the Constitution uh, they they have a popular referendum that wins vastly for the anti-federalists on not holding even a convention to, to ratify the Constitution. Uh, and uh, they're called Rogue Island for that reason. And eventually, under the under the uh, uh, Constitution, when, when the Constitution it does go into effect, uh, they really have to get Rhode Island has to get coerced into uh, uh, into finally joining uh, by uh, uh, congressional coercion and, and some threats against exports so can i just ask a follow-up yes please my question was more contemporary because you were saying that the appeals court uh, is saying make these anti-federalist arguments <laughs> so my question is in your if you were the lawyer making the argument would you be going back to well when abraham lincoln said this da, 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 da. i'm just mm -hmm. was curious if you think that as lawyers are bringing their cases to appeals court, 
is there an anti-federalist path for them to make the argument that when it's discriminatory, blatantly discriminatory, that there could be um, potential for a, a cross state or a national solution? Yeah, I don't know on that particular issue. I do know if say you're arguing uh, uh, the necessity of juries, uh, uh, and if you're in a case where you're where you think you have a right to a trial by jury, say a civil uh, case, and you're not being provided that, uh, there's you can you could then pull on anti-federalists just showing their emphasis and their idea that we need juries as as part of uh, part of a system that works. Uh, uh, I mean, I I need to check the specifics. The in, in the more the recent. Uh, uh, sort of wealth tax case. Uh, I know during oral arguments, uh, somebody was asked about the anti-federalists, but on the issue of equality, I don't know, just because broadly that seems to raise uh, uh, after the 14th amendment. So uh, I would look at the uh, debates over the passage of the 14th amendment, um, just because that's the part of our constitution that deals with it. So I have a question probably related to that one. So. It's at the end, one, one way of thinking is that you have like two things. It's like, first, uh, you want to uh, protect some rights, okay? And then, um, and then essentially you're talking about some kind of balance between the federal government and the state governments or any form of like subnational governments, no? So, and, and it seems that the, the key point here is that, um, what you really want is some kind of balance that persists over time, okay? The main problem is it seems that this looks like a pretty unstable equilibrium. If you are an epsilon to the right, you end up with all too powerful federal government. If you are an epsilon to the left, you end up with very weak republics that can be invaded. So is that part of the issue? So essentially, um, this is not just the anti-federalist saying, hey, this federalist path, it's, uh, it will put that outside the right balance. You, you can also make exactly the same argument on the other side. The whole point is that the balance is, by its nature, pretty unstable. No? And then if that's the interpretation, then the way of thinking this is like, are there any way back when you start going on the... Uh, on the on the on the wrong balance, okay. So essentially, when I'm going out of balance, you have you know some kind of mechanisms that put you back, uh, or, or, or what do we need to now back? Essentially, is the right way of thinking, or maybe yeah. I mean, I I I tried to raise the puzzle as the hardest problem in politics, and I think it is. I I I I, uh, I you know I'd like to look more into ways of promoting this balance, uh, what some people have written about stewards and uh, broadly, the, I mean, it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and we, we, we got one of the greatest leaders in world history uh, out, of, out of Lincoln, but it's it's still a, a tremendous difficulty to, to, to maintain that balance. Uh, I think we need something like moderation and people going out and teaching about moderation to, to promote that. So essentially, maybe that part of like uh, values and virtue and citizenship of the community is your path to keeping this unstable. This without that component, this is a pretty unstable equilibrium. Yeah. But then once you put that whatever into the mix, those values, you can hold it more in some sense. I think you can try, but I think it's our only bet. Uh, it's it's a it's a tremendous challenge, uh, but uh, you know, and, and how we're going to do it is something we're all working on. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's a very wicked problem. Yeah, I think you know, actually, you know, thinking. Oh, I can wait till you. I just wanted to make one comment. Yeah. That it's the strength of civil society. You know, a, dem a democracy depends on the strength of its civil society. Sorry. We'll be talking about that in London. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, sorry. Do you want me to go ahead? Okay. Please, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I was kind of listening. Parking is terrible. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, but I was listening before I slipped in and 
I'd like your questions are asking, you know, and and the, your paper is raising the points, you know, what, how do we bring the anti-federalists into today's world and society? There's a difference between now and the society of that time, right? Where if you were a minority in, you know, certain viewpoints, whether religious or political, like you ended up forming your own communities. Like the Quakers are a great example. We love and adore them today, but they were on the fringe of, of their time. Um, and so, but yet we don't live in that kind of world. The minorities and majorities, they live in the same community. And so is it possible, like, you know, how, so then taking, how would you take that into account when thinking about the anti-federalist approach or the federalist? Well, I, I, I tried to do this towards the end and I'm gonna to try to do it towards the end of the paper. I think that's one area in which recent study from workshoppers on polycentricity has shown us that it can help with deal, dealing with the governance of multi-ethnic uh, multi-background background societies. And I don't think the anti-federalists were aware that you could do that. Uh, but broadly, I think innovations and in, uh, understanding liberalism uh, allows us new tools to do that, that, that they didn't know about. Can I follow that question up with a related one? Yes, please. Which is that um, what if forming minority communities is a response? Is it is a polycentric response? I mean, that seems to have been the polycentricity of the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, even uh, the community of Harmony or New Harmony here in Indiana was so, kind of like a minority community in a sense. They were trying out socialism, you know, and and, and they lived there for I don't remember how long the community that community existed. Two but years. Two years. Yeah, I thought it was like one or two years. It didn't last long. But they didn't try that community in Indianapolis. They they went out into the country and established their own village. And actually they didn't establish a village, it already existed. I think they bought the land from a pre-existing pre -existing group. So yeah, I mean, is that a polycentric response too? Yeah, I, I think so. And, and does polycentricity have to mean this mixing or is it okay if we, you know? I, th I think it's okay, but you need, I do think you need a, a national civil society uh, to, stop, to stop you from, hurting each other and but i think it needs to be based on principles that are first principles and that are uh true uh and so how we do a national civil society is really really difficult uh but one way i think we can promote it is by stopping government from crowding it out uh which is which was what tocqueville uh, warns us will happen and, and what's broadly happened post the new deal i think that the centralization of, of of the federal government beyond anything even the federalist uh thought was going to ha happen or, or, or thought would would have been appropriate has really crowded out civil society in a lot of places nick nick uh roger pilon here yes sorry i am see sorry please go 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 yes um a great talk uh, i expected nothing less from you <laughs> Uh, I want to pick up, however, on the points you made relative to civic virtue, which you said uh, both sides, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, took to be a crucial issue for maintenance of a democratic society. Um, and you, if I understood you correctly, you said that uh, polycentricity and subsidiarity would be uh, conducive to civic virtue um, because there you will find shared norms and values. But I'm not so sure that that is the case and I'd like you to comment on that. Uh, today, of course, we are deeply divided. I just saw this morning, for example, that the National Association of Scholars has come out with a study on, uh, on the, um, the program in Connecticut uh, on civic education, which is replete with the woke agenda, which is surely not going to be met uh, uh, with uh, acclaim throughout the state. And so uh, if civic virtue is so crucial, how do you uh, achieve it uh, in a deeply divided society like we have today? Well, I, I think it's a tremendously difficult thing to do. And it's important always to remember that, yeah, if, if we're going to have a 
a bunch of we're going to respect a bunch of different communities some of these communities are going to come up with ideas that uh we don't think are right i think it's difficult to do a national uh um a, a national uh, uh promotion of civic virtue but i do still think you need to do it i think part of that has to be a respect for people's rights and a respect for equality but uh broadly and and this is more me me spitballing but in, in thinking about the the anti-federalists and federalists one of the things that's wonderful about it is as they they are real brutal to each other they use foul language they use dirty tactics but at the end of the day it's a dialogue and uh i i am very hopeful with the idea of dialogue as as a means of uh of resolving some of these issues even if that it's uh, more naive but i i think understanding that these issues aren't new uh, and, and that we, we've had very deep divisions. And I think studying the Civil War is important for this. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, dialogue's uh, essential for uh, trying to figure out what justice is and, and what, uh, what the answer to these tough questions are. So that's not really a good answer, but I, I don't have the answer. Hopefully, hopefully uh, we'll come up with it. So we are unfortunately over <laughs> since 1 p.m. So I know 30 seconds you want to highlight something, summarize something, and then... Yeah, I, I think that we should think... It, it, I, well, first of all, at the workshop, I, I think we should remember the political theory and the Vincent Ostrom's work and really give it some second second looks because there's some really crucial stuff there. Uh, but I'd also like to bring in, in the anti-federalists. I think they weren't just a historical footnote. I think they, they have some very profound things to say, uh, even when they're wrong, uh, understanding uh, that arguments have two sides, I think is important for us moving forward. So I'd like to see more study and I'd, I'd like to see Herbert Storing's complete anti-federalists back in print uh, and easily available. Thank you very much, Nick. It was very wonderful. So I'm very glad with announcements, but the colloquium and a research series next next week for yeah. sure. Absolutely. And I'm sure there are many other. Uh, Can other I just say I'm the one speaking at the colloquium? Oh, you yes. are the one. Okay, okay. there we go. <laughs> Brenda Bush House, and I'll be speaking on philanthropy as comments. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. So we have spontaneous orders. So. <laughs> And thank you for the people following online too.